provided by human experts assisted uh, with uh, AI technologies. And in this presentation, Fabio will be uh, well discussing how currently within uh, Unbubble's products, they are using these very large um, contextual language models okay, we, we, in their products. So Fabio, you share the screen. So when you're ready, I guess you can. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna talk about these <clears throat> masked language models, which are by now, everyone is probably aware. Uh, but I wanna give some some uh, some better, better context about why they actually matter, uh, why they're that important. And so let, let me start right at the beginning, at the very beginning. So you probably know the language modeling test, the problem where we, what we want to achieve is to model uh, how, how words can, can come in sequence one after the other. So uh, in this example here, you could have several different candidates, even more than those. So what classic models that try to tackle language modeling tried to do was to use like uh, the two previous words and then compute uh, the probability for the next word. Uh, and nowadays you, you can see this in action in your like uh, mobile keyboards. So uh, in your cell phone keyboards where they try to predict the ne next word. Google is using it to uh, in emails and and, uh, and this was really important uh, in the past for speech recognition. Uh, but then we got neural embeddings uh, and it got really popular when neural, net, neural networks started to having to have uh, more impact again due to computing resources and, and new advances. And, and then pre-training became quite popular because of word to vec mostly. And then Glow, FastX, they all followed where for this you would compute a representation for a word instead of just using, uh, let's say, uh, unique identifiers for the words. Uh, learning was much better if you first pre-train using unlabeled data, using these methods, uh, where you could compute a representation, a vector representation for each word. Uh, and this was compute based on the context where the, the words would appear. Uh, and then if you now have your neural network for training for uh, another problem, you, it would greatly benefit your model would learn much faster if you, if you would uh, preload these embeddings in the initial layer. Uh, but here the main drawback is that all the words, all the instances of a given word, let's say, they have a single representation. So uh, we know, of course, that due to ambiguity in, in, in language, the natural ambiguity, um, a given word can have several meanings depending on where they appear. And but by using these word embeddings, although you use the context to learn them, you don't really use the context when you use them in your model. So you kind of lose the the different different meanings between, for example, uh, bank, which is the classic example. Uh, but then we started having some uh progress on recurrent networks like lstms it became it came into the, the spotlight some years ago and the idea was that you could uh pre-train a, a language model and then use those representations uh, in your in your model and this was became quite popular let's say by by elmo which was uh, uh, another embedding uh, learning model that would use bidirectional LSTMs. So you'd have the normal language modeling part and also a reversed uh, language model. And so uh, what you do in your model, would, what Elmo would do would, would be to concatenate both. But here you, you need to notice uh, like the difference that this is done um, a priori, so you're using this model to learn this, and then you have to, to use the same computation when you use this on the downstream model, so that you take into account the context. So you build the embeddings uh, in the initial layers. Uh, 
but then we got this almost two years ago one and a half year ago a uh, breakthrough model which well, would instead of computing both contexts separately you can see here that uh, what is your favorite uh, you can basically have any a lot of different words appearing here and something from sesame street can also have a lot of candidate words but then if you really consider both contexts at the same time it's it's much less ambiguous let's say what what could fit there right so a picture for example doesn't make much sense it's probably character or it could be episode maybe uh, and then this model both uh namely bird made this possible and they came up with this neat idea of grabbing the whole sentence, uh, randomly masking some of the tokens, and then uh, making the model learn to predict those tokens. And this allowed to get much better representations for those uh, for those tokens. And one thing to notice is that you're not we're not using a language model here in the sense that we're not generating language uh, directly. This is mostly for getting a representation. And so in a in a single picture, this would be BERT. So you have a sentence as input, you mask some, some tokens. BERT is a huge transformer model. It's not based on recurrent networks. And then you have a prediction for what words could fit uh, in, in that uh, masked position. Now, <clears throat> nowadays you have several BERT-based models, uh, slightly different, uh, also, some also using another Muppet name. Uh, what they also share in common is that they're really expensive to train. Although you can use unlabeled data, they really take a long time and a lot of uh, TPUs or GPUs. But the good thing is that, uh, as I think almost everyone knows, you have these models available online and you can use hugging face transformers, for example, to use them, which is pretty easy. Now, what, why does this matter for Unbebo? How can we use that? Let me just begin by what Unbebo does actually, besides what uh, Bruno described, or actually describing what Bruno said. Uh, if you look into the translation uh, landscape or as a as a service, let's say, you you basically had two approaches: either using machine learning, uh, just machine only approach, and that's cheap and fast, but the quality is is uh, lacks a lacks a bit. Or you could, you, you could have human professionals translating, and that's, uh, of course, you're going to have a good quality, but it doesn't scale. It's, it takes much much longer, and uh, it's much more expensive. And so what Unbevo does is a hybrid approach, where we first do a, an automatic translation, and then we have a crowd of editors, or native speakers, or uh, fluent speakers, that fix the translation. And in a picture, this would be our pipeline. So we do machine translation, uh, we estimate this quality, and uh, I'm going to talk about this. And then we have a translation community where, uh, where they fix the automatic translation. And then we have this feedback loop that we use to retrain uh, all the models. Yeah, and that's what uh, I'm going to talk about. That's the use case for these language models. So in this block here, we have a, a source text. We have an automatic translation. And we want to assess whether we really need a human to fix it or not, if it's good enough. And we can directly ship it to, to the client. So what is quality estimation? Uh, well, it's assessing how good uh, the translation is. Uh, a thing to consider here is that you don't have access to the, to the MT system or to the MT model. It's a black box. Uh, and it's uh, and you don't have access to the reference also, so you don't really know what would be the correct translation. Uh, this task has been held some uh, yearly competitions uh, together with, uh, as part of the machine translation conference. It takes place every year. There's this uh, track, let's say, uh, about quality estimation. And in 2017, uh, Postec, university, uh, which is a university in South Korea, proposed this predictor estimator model, which was a large neural model that uh, I'm going to get into details, but it was basically the first neural model that uh, got, uh, got very uh, successful. And the curious thing is that it allows to pre-train a part of the model using, uh, 
like a, also a language model task, but something we call a translation language model where you also have to consider the source, not just a single sentence. And it looks essentially like Elm, as we're gonna see, but it came out before Elm, even before Elm. So this is the basic building blocks of the predictor simulator. The green box are, uh, boxes are the predictor. Uh, and when you're pre-training, you have a source text and a reference text as input. So target is a reference text. And what you do is, in a, like in a similar fashion as to BERT, you mask one word at a time and make the model try to uh, learn to predict what word is missing. And that's basically the pre-training procedure. And then you stack the estimator on top of it after pre-training is done, and you fine tune it to the different QE uh, tracks, uh, which are predicting the sentence uh, score. HDR is a human error, translation error rate, which is like how much you have to change in that sentence to make it correct. And you can also predict okay or bad tags for, for each token. And this is our the like internal states of the predictor. Uh, I'm not sure if this works. You can see my my pointer, but original sentence here is the source text in the original uh, in the source language, and then you have a translation here as y. So what essentially you do is you get all the left context and the right context, and you compute a hidden representation for the word at position j. And that becomes part of the features that you're going to output. So, and then you see here, you have uh, some attention on the source side, which you combine. And that's what, that's basically what the predictor does. And this is pretty similar to what Elmo would do. Uh, this green rectangle here, uh, it's basically like Elmo. You have two, by, uh, you have two LSTMs, uh, left to right and right to left, modeling the, the context. Um, one, one, one important thing to notice is that you don't have yj, the input at position j, anywhere. So you're really masking it out. Otherwise, you're just leaking information. All right. Uh, there was no reference implementation for the predictor estimator, but we published it. We did our, we made our own implementation and published it as part of OpenQ, which is a quality estimation toolkit that we released one year ago. Uh, and this is an example of how we would do quality estimation and use open QE. So uh, let's say you have this simple sentence in English, you have a translation in French, which is which makes sense. And then the full predictor estimator would output probabilities like this. So they are really low. These are probabilities of the word being bad. So here they are low, so they, they are all okay. But let's say you have the same uh, source sentence that translated in some gibberish uh, here. So the Peter Smith outputs some really high probabilities of those words being uh, out of context. And then you get tags like this. And these are real examples. All right, so how do we, why do we have this, these two things? How do we combine them? So if we look again at this, the predictor simulator blocks uh, and the, the one I where I described the predictor. Although it's pretty similar to Elmo, it also resembles BERT a lot in the sense that uh, you want to build the, you want to get a representation for each word in the, in the sentence considering the full context. And we actually did it. We replaced the predictor with BERT and XLM, which is another BERT based model. Uh, and we use it in this quality estimation competition last year. And we got really good results doing that. Uh, these numbers here, this, uh, the, the bottom two here is for English German, are our models. And they are basically a combination of uh, a BERT based predictor estimator, an XLM estimator, and the, the normal predictor estimator. So it's an ensemble of those. And we got much better results. This is at the this is at the sentence level. We also got much better results than other participants. Uh, and if you compare the state of the art in 2018 to 2019, we got a big jump. 
But again, these are ensemble of those masked language model systems. Uh, but the interesting thing is that although we used BERT and XLM, which are pretty similar, trained in a different way, ensembling them, got, we got even better numbers, meaning that uh, and ensembling with the predictor simulator, we also got better numbers, meaning that there's different things that all the models are learning that we still have to explore. Now, another use case we have in-house that uh, I, I'm not, I don't have time to get into a lot of detail is that uh, recently, as, as one year ago, uh, there's increasing, as I really like the discussion about how to evaluate machine translation system is uh, increasing a lot, even than before. So, because the standard metric is blur, which requires a reference translation and it's based on uh, engrams of words. Uh, and the recent results have shown that uh, if you have a really good performing uh, empty systems and you want to compare them, if you use blur, you really get the basically negative correlation with human judgment on the translation of those systems. So there are several problems here, uh, like requir requiring a translation, a reference translation means that you, you don't give room to like alternative translations that might be equally correct. Uh, and it, it doesn't it doesn't help you in, in in our scenario, for example, where it doesn't really matter if it's exactly the same reference translation. Uh, and so what we could do is we could take a source text, a machine translated ver version of the of the text, and then uh, no reference or up to n references, and you. We could encode those using the, these masked language model systems and then use those as, a, as a, an evaluation metric or to assess the, the difference, different quality between different MT models. And that's been done in, uh, since a couple of years ago. Uh, it's starting to get more, more traction now. There's a, even a, a, another competition on these evaluation metrics. And it's inter interesting that if you take a look that if you don't have any reference, you actually have a quality simulation system. So it's, these are pretty similar. And we're, we're work working in-house in this problem uh, because we really want to better evaluate uh, our empty models. So to wrap up, uh, these masked language models do really provide a good represent representation for words and sentences. Uh, you, you all know that they are being used in a lot of different tasks. So transfer learning is working. Quality estimation is another example and retrieval. I, I found this out, it's not really my expertise, but I found out that this new paper uses basically BERT and uh, retrieves from Wikipedia to get really better uh, numbers on question answering. Um, and then Quality estimation is really important at the level. Uh, we have these masked language models uh, supported in our internal version. We haven't released it yet in the open version. We should do it soon. Uh, and they have a, the real, a very good advantage of using those models that we can get those pre-trained models and then just fine tune them for uh, whatever amount of unlabeled data or parallel data we have. So when we want to have support a new language pair, uh, we don't need to first build a, a large parallel corpus. We can take a pre-trained model and fine tune it. And that would give us a, a good generic quality estimation model. But the main drawback of those models that we learned from, from, from experience is that they are very uh, brittle. So it's hard to, to make them, to, to find the, the right hyperparameters. They are very sensitive to, to that. Um, and that's it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me, especially Bruno. Okay. Uh, thanks, Fabio. So, uh, yeah, we have time for questions. Again, I would uh, invite the attendees to raise their hands, and maybe uh, leave their comments here, um, either on the Q&A or if uh, you raise your hands, we can add you uh, to the call and you can share your microphone and speak as well. Um, in the meantime, maybe I can start with a quick question. So, um, 
Yes, so many of these um, um, pre-trained language models, they kind of impose hard limitations on the size of the inputs that are processed, right? And in this specific application of quality estimation, um, I'm assuming that often you have uh, references and, and translations that, uh, that are still quite large, right? So how, how do you handle that? How do you handle these long documents for which you may need to have to estimate uh, translation quality? Yeah, that's a good point. If uh, we're not really tackling uh, or exploring anything at the like real document level, meaning, of course, it would that's in the we really want to explore it. It's in the horizon. So you want to assess the document, the quality of a full email, let's say translated email. But right now we are, we're only doing it uh, sentence by sentence. Uh, of course, we have this length problem. So the 512 uh, word pieces from BERT are a limitation sometimes, especially because we're concat we usually concatenate source and translation. So we really have the two sentences and they have to fit. Uh, for the shared task, or the, this only happened in the pre-training uh, corpus. So we just got rid of those sentences. We didn't really explore. They have this trick where you actually split a sentence and then you copy some of the tokens to give a context. But that didn't really matter for us. So we just dropped those. Now in real cases uh, where you cannot just ignore those, one alternative is to first encode the source sentence and then encode the target sentence. So you could get a longer sentence to fit. But if that still fails, then uh, it's it's not a, a blocker for us right now. But if, if it becomes in the future, we have to explore those other models that don't have this limitation. BERT is known for, the, for that, right? But there are others that use those uh, sinusoidal uh, position embeddings, and those don't have this limitation. Mm -hmm. So we had here, um, well, another question uh, from Max that just raised his hand. Maybe Max, you can uh, open the mic and, and leave your question here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my question would be, um, is there a way to make use of the manual corrections to further improve the model? Um, or, is, or maybe even like to train a correction model on top of it? Or is the data volume just too low? No, no, that, there is a way. Yeah, I, I didn't get into the detail, but uh, what you do to get a gold corpus for quality estimation, let's say, is you have a source text, you have a machine translation version, and then you have a post-edit version, which it, which would be the correct one, right? And so what you do is you compute the, basically the, you do the alignment between the machine translated and the post-edit versions. And then you know all the words that were changed are, are bad. Uh, and then you also, you're also able to compute the TR score, the effort rate score. That's basically, yeah, based on edit distance. And that's how you can deal with the corpus and then retrain your model. Was that it? Was that your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Fabio, so, so there's another one on the q and essentially um, related to how you are using quality estimation afterwards in your uh, deployed products, right? So could you talk a bit about how you make use of quality estimation um, together with the crowdsourcing part and how you use quality estimation together with uh, the human experts that are providing the translation? Well, yeah, I think it's better if I, if I show in the, our pipeline. So our scenario is really this one. We, we use this quality estimation system in this uh, uh, light, light green part here, uh, where we get, the, we, we get the source text and the machine translated text, and we compute the scores. So, and then we have some rules here to decide whether the quality is good enough uh, or not. And then if it's not, it's not very good, we just send it to the normal pipeline where we get the, the, the crowd of editors to fix the translation. But if it does have a good quality, then we just skip the humans. So that's why it's important for, for the on the business side uh, to decrease the delivery time and costs. 
if we have a good quality estimation. We, re we really want to avoid, for example, uh, skipping jobs that have some critical efforts. And that's the challenge in quality estimation. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yeah, maybe another quick one. Um, so you haven't covered this at all in your talk, but uh, so a part of this pipeline is actually also um, machine translation, right? And in that context, so so in the context of generating translations from the input texts, are you nowadays using also these uh, large pre-trained language models like BERT or you're using something else? Yeah, no, we're using uh, transformers. We, we made the switch and well, still switching. Uh, but no, we have plain uh, normal, let's say, uh, machine translation models, not, not really those big ones based on BERT. We, okay. So we, we have, since we trained them from scratch, we have our own models, our own data. Uh, we're not do, using any pre-trained part yet. But where, where these masked language models fit into machine translation is in that evaluation part that I mentioned. So mm -hmm. if you have, yeah, so if you have different data and uh, different parameters, anyone to know anyone to know if your model is uh, better than the one you already have in production, using a better evaluation uh, mm -hmm. system like those, yeah, would be much better because sometimes what we do in practice is we compute the the blue score, and then you have a higher blue score, and then okay. This model is probably better, but we're not really sure until we do some translations and ask for humans to annotate or post that. And then we're able to measure the real quality. And then we see if that, uh, that model is really better. So blue sometimes usually correlates with a higher quality, uh, but not always. And that's the, the thing we want to mm -hmm. fix by using those pre trained yeah, because because mask language modeling and generation, these two don't really. So you need to extend these models to the generation scenario, right? Yeah, you do have this decoder now, decoders <clears throat> way of doing decoding with BERT, but it's really uh, a bit more cumbersome than, than just yeah. having the, the, the yeah, the, uh, like a dedicated machine translation model here. Okay, so. Um, yeah, I guess I guess this is it. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you. Um, I guess we can now move on to the final talk uh, within this session. Um, so, yeah, exactly. I was going to ask you that. Um, so, so yeah, this final talk is actually coming from Farfetch, okay, another company um, headquartered in in Lisbon. Um, in this case, actually, uh, well, in least in Portugal, let's call it that, with offices uh, 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 within uh, within the two uh, major cities. So Farfetch is a, actually a, a, an online retail platform for um, uh, high-end fashion products. Um, search and recommendation is a huge part of that, of course, and the talk is going to be covering and discussing different aspects related to um, faceted search, uh, user modeling, uh, ranking. Okay, so the talk will be delivered by uh, Pedro, Diogo, and uh, Ricardo. So yeah, you're now sharing the screen. So uh, when you're ready, I guess you can start. Oh wow! How is everyone today? So can you see my screen and hear me properly? Uh, yeah, I think we're fine. So the screen is not really. Yeah. So if you could make it a bit. Uh, yeah. Ah, that's it. Okay. Much better. Thanks. Okay, so this is perfect now, right? Just making sure that uh, can you see the full screen, right? Oh, it was. Uh, uh, before it was a bit. So if you press again this uh, full screen thing, uh, yeah, I think now it's perfect. Okay, oops. So hi everyone. So I hope you're having a lot of fun in the conference and you're learning a lot. So it's kind of troubling times. I think the conference has helped a lot. So it's been really interesting to see talks while being closed in inside our homes. And I'm really glad the conference went through. So I'm Pedro Nogueira and I've been working at Farfetch in IA for three years now. And I'll be presenting alongside my colleagues, Diego Steves and Ricardo Souza, about IA projects being developed with Farfetch and how they evolve. So first and foremost, let's give a quick overview about the talk. So I'll be talking about what is Farfetch. Uh, then I'll be mentioning a quick overview about faceted search. 
about how the project evolved. Then my colleague Diego Steves is going to join me to talk about how the such system works. And finally, Ricardo, so Ricardo Souza will be giving some closing remarks and we'll briefly mention a new project being developed at Farfetch around conversational engines. But before all of this, uh, let's just try to understand how does Farfetch work. So in case you don't already know, Farfetch is a luxury e-commerce, uh, luxury fashion website that works worldwide. So we provide access to the finest boutiques and brands around the world that want to have their stock on our website. So given that, let, let's mention a, a very concrete example of how our website works. So let's say that we have Anna. Anna is a fashion lover, she's from Moscow, and she really likes a boutique that's in Paris. And she specifically likes the sneakers that are present in that boutique. But she doesn't want to go to Paris just to buy those sneakers. So the sneakers, are, Paris is amazing. She really likes the sneakers, but she doesn't want to go to Paris just to buy the sneakers. Well, the boutique also wants to sell them and wants to connect with their customers. So how, how can we solve this problem? Well, Farfetch has an answer for that. Uh, that boutique can use our services, Farfetch's service, uh, to provide Anna with, with that item. So how does that work? How does the item get to Farfetch? So the item is sent to Portugal to be cataloged, photographed, tagged, and then placed in our website if that specific item is not already there. So that product is then sent back to the boutique. And now Anna can access that item in a preferred device. So now can, she can see her sneakers, she can interact with them, and she can effectively buy them. So after buying them, uh, that, product, that product is shipped to Anna in a beautiful and high quality package uh, because she's really paying a lot. It's a luxury item. So the package must be really perfect. So that's something that we emphasize on. So let's give a few data about Farfetch. So we're a platform with over 2 million active consumers. We have an average, average order value of $608 per order. And we have 4,500 highly qualified and multilingual staff in 14 locations worldwide. So we're quite a big company right now. So really have to answer a question, which is why is the luxury market so special? Why is it different from other markets? So here are some, some of the answers for that. So fashion trends change very fast. What is true in one season might not be true in the next one. So that's really important to take into consideration. Luxury fashion customers really buy uh, items like artists bought. So it's kind of a different purchase and they expect to feel an emotional connection and a really a high end experience when purchasing. So it, it's really a niche, uh, a niche market. The question that we pose ourselves as, as IR practitioners is how can we help fashion lovers really find great products knowing all of these these constraints of the, the, the market and the way that it behaves differently. So this is a, a quick picture of our website. So what I'm going to talk about is about these, which are our facets. So customers can interact with them and they can browse for thousands and sometimes in millions of products that are present in our website and they need, be, do, they need to be ordered in some, in some fashion. So how are they effectively ordered? So the idea for these, the next slides is really to give an honest view of how the project evolved in Farfetch. So since the very, the very beginning to what we are right now. So the project really started with a simple point-wise loss of regression. At the time we used simple features as transactions, clicks, stocks to attempt to predict the conversion rate of products. And we updated the ranks at a bi-weekly basis. So this was really a long time ago. Really the first iterations of the project, we started with something really simple and explainable that we can explain the business, how it worked. And it really did turn out pretty well. We did a lot of iterations on this, a lot of baby tests were done with this, but then we moved on to a different approach. So a new concept really was introduced. So we now had a two piece rank. So the products for the most popular pages, the top K products were manually created by fashion experts. So these fashion experts really knew what was going on in the fashion world. They, were, they looked at all the runways and they manually created a, small, a very small percentage of the, of the web pages. The entire, uh, the rest of the website was still ranked by a pointwise loss of regression. So this actually won an A-B test because we really had fashion experts manually creating the, the product. So it was really interesting to see. So, Afterwards, we decided to add a bit of more complex approach. So we added uh, a time-based ranker per country. 
So the idea for this ranker was to try to predict the transactions and clicks per country for the next day. So we're a worldwide platform. We have very different customers with very different tastes. So we really wanted to add this, this segmentation approach to our, to our ranks. So we add a lot more features to this. We had a lot more complex models. As we updated the ranks daily, we could really train complex models to, to update those ranks with. So afterwards, this was actually a very interesting approach that we did here. So basically in this stage, we tried to apply an heuristic to the top K products in some pages. So this was a very simple approach, simple heuristic. So we basically, we grabbed the output of the time-based rank of a country and we applied an heuristic that tried to apply a color flow, a visual flow and add some diversity to the top ranks. So the idea of this was that we had fashion customers, high-end fashion customers, and they, they not only like the rank because of its individual relevance, but because of the rank as a whole. So that rank had to be beautiful. It had to add some sort of color flow. So despite this being a simple heuristic, this actually won against the, an output of the sole prediction of the same model. So applying a re-rank that added a color flow, a visual flow to it, actually won an A-B test against a pure output of the model. So this was a very interesting A-B test with this. So what do we do now? So we, we kind of rolled back on that approach. It yielded really good results for some time, but we decided to go back to manual creation. It's really working right, really well right now. And we now have a learning to rank approach with several different segments. So we still compute ranks in a batch system, but it has a very short delay. And that delay is really important for us because sometimes products can start selling very fast. For example, there's an example of Kanye West sneakers that suddenly we start selling them very, very fast. So we need to update the ranks as soon as possible. We still use clicks and transactions as relevant signals, and we use a tree-based model. So these are actually some of the pitfalls that we had. So these are some of the things that we are surely interesting to talk about it. If someone is interested as well, let's talk about them after the, this talk. One of them is multi-objective ranking. So as you might have seen during this talk, so we kind of shifted from the, the thing that we optimize. And this is actually a very old question in IR, which is what is relevance? So in our specific scenarios, is relevance transactions, clicks, add to back, is it conversion rate? Is there a mix of all of them? If it's a mix, how should we rate it? So we had several answers for this. We actually tried to test them several times, uh, uh, but we still have this, this open question. Another one is user's noise. So we spent quite some time in trying to isolate, isolate really the fashion lovers and our fashion customers uh, to make sure that we are amplifying them in our data set and we're actually training models that are going to predict ranks that fashion lovers really like. So we had some problems with position bias and biases overall in the past. So that's something that we're very aware of. We tried several strategies with that, but if you want to discuss them, we're very glad to do that as well. Finally, I think this is the most common problem in data science projects with this engineering and data related problems. So we'd like to have a personalized rank and we're actually trying to go there as soon as possible, uh, but we simply don't have the engineering platform for that yet. So now my colleague Diego Stimps will talk about a bit about the search system. So please Diego, take it away. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Pedro, for that. Um, so now I want to jump and uh, give you uh, some sort of like overview of our work in, in the search um, area and uh, highlight the framework we, we've designed it and uh, have been working on to enhance the, the search experience to our customers. Yeah, next bit. Uh, I think um, I think the main, you, you jump at, like, to, at, at once, Pedro. I think the main difference here uh, is that we, we are dealing with uh, natural language, uh, meaning we, we have to perform a natural language understanding. It's, it's uh, a key step uh, to, to us uh, as we need to, to build up uh, our meta information prior to perform the, the retrieval of our products. So in this example, we, we, we can see a query, which is a uh, Valentino blue cotton dress. Um, and the, the first thing we, we have to do is like the, the first challenging uh, step lies in correctly detecting and linking the, the, those entities uh, so that we know uh, a priori that uh, the customer is looking not only for like in this example, a, a blue dress, uh, but also the one uh, which contains cotton in the material, let's say, and also is designed by, by Valentino, right? Um, so this is a bit of challenging. Next. 
So I, I want to give you a little a little bit of history here. Um, we, we started uh, some time ago uh, in the um, with very specific, very uh, sorry, um, very simplistic model here. Uh, Basically, in 2012, uh, we launched the, the first version uh, of our search engine, mostly uh, relying and mostly like featuring uh, by stop words uh, in its uh, NLP component. Later, we moved it and uh, introduced a little, more, a little bit more flexibility uh, with lexical variation, uh, but still providing a feature-based system. So I, I think the biggest achievement uh, we, we have now is uh, our platform, which is more aligned with state-of-the-art components uh, so that you can plug in uh, several uh, uh, machine learning components as uh, underlying um, features for, for, for to perform the search, right? Next. So this is example uh, is just uh, an overview we, we have uh, within search, which uh, it's basically state of the art uh, to perform uh, name its entity recognition. Uh, you have bidirectional bi LSTMs uh, with the uh, CRFs as output layers, right? Later actually we discovered that post taggers was not really helpful um, because the text is super noisy. So it's really hard to properly classify nouns and verbs and et cetera uh, in, in such context. Although you have some uh, specific post taggers uh, trained for, for, for this noisy uh, environment. Um, but yeah, we, it didn't help uh, much, right? But then still this uh, helped us to, to really increase the, the performance of our, our system. Next. Um, so what, what, what have you been working on, uh, basically? There are like several challenges here. Um, one is the internationalization uh, of our, our platform. Uh, as a global platform, we, we currently support English, Portuguese, German, and Chinese. Uh, and also we are following uh, what we have as state of the art. Uh, of course, we have some modifications here and there uh, with word embeddings or factor embeddings, but overall, uh, you have the stack, which is LSTMs and CR apps. Um, it's it's been a, a bit hard for Chinese, uh, mostly because of segmentation. It's a common uh, and known problem um, uh, that people have to deal with. Uh, but also, we we've been working on uh, identification of compounds, words, uh, and persons and personalization, so that we we know uh, if a specific customer. Uh, is, is looking for a specific keyword, we, we could use uh, historical data to try to uh, improve the, the, the performance of the models. Next. Um, also, we, we have been working on stall checkers uh, so that we can fix uh, the, the, the queries. So it's really working on the, the initial uh, part of this platform. Uh, so if someone just types uh, like Adidas in this example with, uh, to this, then you can fix it and then um, forward the, the, the correct uh, token. Next. Also a ranking uh, for, for free text. Uh, there are some simplistic models. Um, we are still exploring uh, different alternatives here, uh, but one which uh, I mean, show it to be really, really um, helpful, uh, although it's quite simple. It's uh, the one based on popularity. So basically you consider the overall popularity of a specific uh, product as a sign off uh, when you are ranking uh, your, your results uh, on free, free text. Also um, query extension. Uh, so if you have a certain query like biker jacket, I'll talk a little bit, a bit about this later. Um, you can basically expand to different surface forms of, of this. Yeah, next. Uh, and how, how we do this? Basically, uh, one of the one of the alternatives, are actually the best one, it's using knowledge graphs. Um, so you have uh, some some sort of uh, a common sense database with a knowledge graph aligned to try to optimize uh, the, the the models. Um, such as if someone is looking for uh, a specific biker, biker uh, jacket, let's say the, the one that you see here uh, with the Ford logo, 
but then the guy may be, or he or she would also be interested in, in different versions uh, uh, of this uh, product, right? So why not also provide this example and uh, putting those on, on top in case they are relevant? Yeah, next. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool, cool. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, these developments are rather recent. We have been working in the past five years on involving our platform with AI technologies while assisting fashion experts and delivering content to fashion lovers. We have released a couple of papers, APD, as um, Diego has shared. And today, we have released a technical blog at Farfetch blog site. So feel free to go there and to have a look at it. So thank you once again, Diego and Pedro, for, for the uh, uh, nice overview. Um, as you can imagine, these lines of research and development tailored for product development converge to the following. How can we provide the current narrative of Farfetch available brands and products in the entire customer journey? It is ne not necessary to say much that consists the massive shift from search and click paradigm into conversational assistance in online shopping is more than clear the path towards conversational engines that I'm going to explain on the next slide. So we are working on a new generation of tax-oriented conversational engines that interact with users using verbal and visual information in a seamless manner. Uh, through the conversation, we aim to provide target advice and physical store-like experience while maintaining user engagement, and this is rather challenging. So what governs iFetch, which is the name of this project, is a consortium to leverage the collaborative work with CMU, Instituto Superior Técnico, and Universidade Nova Lisboa. We are only starting now, so if you have further questions or suggestions that you would like to for us to pursue, I'm more than happy to walk you through on Slack or in other ways possible. Um, on the next slide, please. So thank you very much for your attention, and we are more likely to um, more happy than uh, to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you all. Um, yeah, it was a great talk. Uh, at this time, perhaps I would invite, invite all the um, speakers in this session to join in again. Um, so I noticed that they're still here. So we have again time for some questions regarding uh, this talk and uh, the other talks in the session as well. Uh, feel free to raise your hand in case you have questions to the speakers or leave your comments on the, on the Q&A. Um, yeah, I'll perhaps start with, um, well, one question here related, um, to, let's say, to the engineering aspects behind uh, some of the things that you discussed here, right? So you talked about many different types of models, approaches for doing ranking, approaches for doing query expansion. So I imagine that there are a lot of challenges in deploying these systems, right? Like, for instance, how often do you update these models? Um, could you talk a bit about that, about the challenges of really deploying some, some of the things that you mentioned here? Peter, would you like to take this one, for instance? Um, yes, yeah, sure. So that's, that's actually a, a very interesting question. So it, it usually is not, not so hard to, de to really develop a really great machine learning model in a notebook or in your computer or in a or in a GPU, so it's usually, it takes some time, but it, it's actually not that hard, but developing and making sure that it's going to work inside a platform that has several constraints, several pro problems, and you have to make sure that you maintain performance. So, so that's quite a different problem altogether. So I'm not going to specify any problems that we've had, but the thing I think it, it's, it's really a learning process that when you're developing a new model, when you're thinking of a new feature, you have to make sure that everything is going to work in a platform. Everything is going to answer fast. Uh, so that, 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 that's a, a bit about that. I think my answer is really, you need to have really a, a good thought process when developing models to make sure that everything is going to fit in your platform. And if you think about that, I think you're going to do all right. If you're not doing that when developing the model, I think you're going to have a lot of problems when deploying it. Mm -hmm. uh yeah, so so there's <laughs> there's a comment from Stuart here saying that uh, well he, he really likes how you bring in 
the aesthetics and the colors, right? So, so, so there was a, a slide in which you kind of show products uh, more or less ranked by a degree uh, of colors. And uh, yeah, I, I imagine that in, in, in a system such as yours, right? So you're probably, so even your last uh, slide about the project talked about multimodal interaction, right? So you have products, you have metadata on these products and you have uh, pictures, right? So currently in the services that you're providing, are you also using um, computer vision techniques in combination with language processing in order to understand relationships between queries and products, for instance, or is this something a part of things that you're planning to develop? Yes, sure. So yeah, in, indeed, we are um, are using multimodal approach in order to extract uh, the information, the visual information from the products, and of course incorporating that on the ranking. And this is something that we're going to continuously evolve, uh, of course, A-B tests, because uh, as Pedro has mentioned and, and Diego as well, uh, all of the changes that we do around our platform are um, uh, aim of an A-B test. And the, the ones that we present so far significantly improve our uh, measurement business metrics. So th definitely, this is the, the lines of work that we're going to continue to pursue. Okay. So, so I also have, let's say, a more general um, question and comment that applies actually to all the presenters and all the presentations that we saw, right? So we saw three examples of companies that work uh, closely with the universities and with academics, right? So companies that have a strong, uh, let's say, connection to, to, to academics and to academia. So. In, in your specific case, and afterwards, I would probably uh, invite also Fabio and Stuart to, to join in again and comment on their specific experiment uh, regarding that. But, but on your specific case, how do you see this uh, relation with the university? Okay, so for instance, you were presenting now a recent project um, in which you are collaborating with, uh, with the universities. So how, is, how does that work? Okay, so what types of mechanisms do you actually use to collaborate with academia? Um, I don't know if someone wants to start or I may give them some some hints here or something like so I, I think this is this is a must uh, I would say because we we have to always try to uh, bring what we have in the best in the academia uh, and then apply so right uh, so uh, having the, the applied research really working well. Uh, of course, we might have some issues uh, with the data itself. This, this ha happens uh, to everyone. Uh, it's not specific to Farfetch. But uh, in case we have this, we can also have like work around, right? We can, we can try to apply the, um, uh, the, the models or the algorithms uh, in, in, in the same context, right? So if, if we're like training any uh, R model and then we don't want to share, we can't share maybe a, a specific information, we can try to model this with using um, similar similar data such as uh, microblogs, uh, for instance, uh, which have the, the same level of noisiness. So I think it's, you can always try to, you, you should always uh, try to find a, a way um, to see what, what's happening in academia uh, so that you can boost uh, your, your, your platform, your, your engine, uh, and have a better results. I think this is, is a must uh, if you wanna if you wanna grow and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And for you specifically, okay. So do you um, let's say do you try to bring in academia to you? Okay, maybe receiving students or receiving um, faculty as uh, researchers there for some time. Yeah. You think that's easier, or instead do you try to um, well? Um, get your data to academics, right? In the sense that through this collaboration, you provide data sets and tasks and specific problems. And then within academia, uh, uh, researchers and students work on these problems on their own. Okay? So how are you, what's your strategy regarding that? Let me you just, jump in, Ricardo? Yes, yes let then, me just add a uh, comment on top of what Diego just said. Um, it's just for a, give a very good example, the, this um, brief overview that Diego has shared with all of us today, started with a master thesis. 
Okay. So we onboarded uh, uh, and the uh, student uh, uh, was in, um, Jose Marcelino and he still is with us to, uh, today uh, on several different projects around natural language processing. And the, the, the project started like that. We, we had the challenge, uh, a challenge that we aim to tackle somewhere in time in, within um, a given time frame in, a, in our horizon. Um, and um, we continue to challenge the student, of course, and his uh, supervisor. How can we drive first with the insights uh, for the set of the art? And of course, trying to match accordingly uh, with the, our platform capacity and of course, business needs. Uh, so it was in, in a way, it was, um, it was us that put forward the challenge. But uh, similarly, the, the, the behavior can be um, on the opposite direction. So the academia can approach us and, okay, I have this challenge. What do you think? Do you like to be part of? And for example, as well, the, the last slides I have presented, this collaborative effort that we are currently starting with, with the Cardinal University and EST in um, Nova Lisboa, is just that. Um, there, there was a challenge, uh, a very interesting challenge, uh, and very difficult one to, to, to grasp. And let, let's move on. Uh, let's, uh, let's leverage all the knowledge that exists within the consortium and within, of course, the business, so we can move, move on onwards. Hmm. So I think in our case, um, we were working with the company and, and the university. Um, it's, it's supported by uh, an Innovate UK knowledge transfer partnership. So there's a specific framework in place um, to support the collaboration between companies and the university. Um, I think that's a really important aspect of, of enabling that, um, you know, making sure that the, the frameworks are there. Um, in a kind of personal capacity as well. So the, the, the job that I'm doing is the first job kind of after my PhD. So the, the, the working on these kind of projects, it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of industry, a little bit in university, um, almost like a sort of industry postdoc. Yeah, so I think that's um, quite an interesting aspect of it. That's so that kind of framework to, to enable these collaborations um, is important. So if I understood correctly, in, the, in this case, you're uh, financed, let's say, through a, a government project to to uh, help bootstrap this collaboration, right? Yeah, that's that's right. So um, the the sort of framework is um, sponsored by UK government, you know, and it enables um, companies and universities to 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 do projects like this, quite long term projects. Um, and essentially, you know, within the KTP framework, um, what they're doing essentially is hiring a lot of, you know, PhDs or master students and putting them into companies um, to do to do projects. Um, so I work, although I'm employed by the university, I work in the company full time, mm -hmm. um, and we've got supervisors from the university, and we collaborate and have project meetings and things. Yeah. So. It's... And in your specific case, do you keep activities? Um... In the university, I mean, do you, for instance, advise students, or so? How do you manage this connection between the company and the university? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, so, based in the company, um, full time, but obviously I'm going uh, to the university to visit the the academic collaborators. Um, I do meet this others a wider, um, you know, PhD student community there as well. You know, there's quite a, a lot of um, IR students at, at uh, Strathclyde as well. Um, and obviously the academic team come to the, the, the company as well um, for project meetings and collaborations. Yeah, so it's um, a bit of both, yeah. It's quite interesting. So I don't know if Fabio is uh, on the call. So do you, yeah. uh, do you have a perspective on that as well? You coming from academia uh, in a way, okay, as well to, to yeah. the industry? Yeah, yeah, I made the switch from academia to the industry. Uh, but I'd say Unbebo has a really has really strong ties with uh, academia, uh, uh, both in the terms of uh, in terms of European projects. So we have right now half a dozen pr projects, European and Portuguese projects, uh, and those are basically all in collaboration with different universities, both in Portugal and uh, CMU, for example. Uh, and then also in terms of 
students that uh, get to intern at Envavo and uh, a, a good part of those actually stay because they like the environment. So that helps. And then uh, I don't know the, the, the chicken and pro problem, whether we get these uh, we get this much students and projects because we have visibility at, uni at conferences. So we usually participate. And, and maybe that's uh, because we have this uh, really strong focus on research at the company. And so we do participate in conferences and uh, in the shared test and, and, and collaborate and sometimes publish. Uh, or if it's the other way around, it doesn't really matter. But, uh, and then we also have Andrea Martins, the head of AI at Unpebble, who's also invited professor at Technical. So that, of course, helps a lot. So we have a bunch of students interning at Unpebble where uh, different teams get to, to advise them and work with them. And they are really part of the company uh, environment. So uh, all, all meetings and uh, reading groups and all that. So that so helps to get this. When you, yeah. when you receive students, um... I mean, do you integrate them into teams and it's the entire team that accompanies these research activities that are being pursued in the company or, or does this, so these, do these people have a, let's say a mentee or a, an advisor within the company that closely follows uh, what he's doing? How do you, how do you do that? Yeah, exactly. So it depends on what they're working on, of course, but, uh, but that's the, the interesting thing because we can give them problems that we don't really have the, the manpower to tackle now. So they can try to pursue the, because it's still like very initial stages of research. So uh, so they tackle those and then someone from uh, a related team, uh, yeah, advises them or mentors them as from, from the company side, right? Mm -hmm. That has been working quite well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do, do your academic collaborators um, well, visit and, and regularly meet with you as well. So when we are receiving these uh, individuals, how do you manage the, let's say, the bridge between the academia and the, and the company, right? So, so you were mentioning, for instance, that some of your, uh, 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 let's say, senior research scientists, they come from academia, they have their own ties and their connections to academia. It's mostly through these connections that these activities take place, or no, you're nowadays receiving uh, applications and interested individuals coming from academia to you in order to have well students and have people working with you now yeah that, that's what i what, why i think participating in the in conferences uh, helps right uh, so we got this visibility and we have students from everywhere applying for the internships uh, and and of course they are at a phd program or a master program and so yeah but now we also have sometimes uh, visiting some visiting scholar uh, as a part of a second man from on, one of those projects. That also helps, but uh, mostly because of the projects. Mm -hmm. I see that there are some interesting comments here in the chat window regarding how, well, how to bootstrap activities like this and collaborations like, like this. So, um, yeah, I don't know if uh, the other attendees have uh, other comments or other uh, questions that they would like to, to, to put to the speakers in the session. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, so, yeah, I think we're also more or less on time. Um, in terms of the program here, so we're now uh, having a lunch break uh, in ECIR, okay? So activities will resume by 14 hours uh, with a panel uh, that is actually quite related to, to the industry day talks that we had as well, okay? So the ECIR panel is going to be focusing on conversational search, a hot topic nowadays that, well, cuts across some of the presentations that we had seen here as well. So I invite you all to join. The industry day will then resume by uh, 20 past uh, three, okay? Uh, and in this last session, we'll again have two um, presentations followed by uh, an invited keynote, okay? So um, hope you enjoy the rest of the day, the rest of the conference, and see you all, um, well, at the panel and then on the last session for the industry day, okay? Thank you and, and thanks again to, to all the speakers. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Yeah.
拜拜。